welcome once again to the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and it is a pleasure for me to be with you during this hour. And we have part of the 3ABN family here as we go through this lesson number six, a very important lesson as well. And we want to present to you the members of the family that are here to study with you, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, John. I'm going to be covering the temptation of Egypt. Excellent. We have Pastor Terry Shelton. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here and among these very special lady and gentlemen that uh, I'm glad to be a part of. Excellent. We have Pastor John Lomacang. What day do you have? What's your title? Wednesday, I'm going to be talking about the Babel Coalition. A Babel Coalition. Wow. And we have Miss Shelley Quinn. It's a pleasure to be here. My day is the tithe of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. Well, before we begin, we are going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I'm asking Sister Shelley Quinn if you'll lead us in prayer, please. Absolutely. Our loving, holy, and righteous Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, approaching your throne of grace, Lord, to ask that we know we are but dust, and your words are spiritual, they're spiritually discerned. So we pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit now. May your Holy Spirit come and be our teacher. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Yes, uh, we depend on God's blessing, God's Holy Spirit as we study and share. Uh, the lesson uh, is the title, The Roots of Abraham, and the memory text as we have it in the lesson is from the New King James Version, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. And this is what we have, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. I don't know if you have ever done that. Go out and you don't know where you're going. But Abraham was called by God to do this. And by this time that we are in lesson number six, we have reached what, they, what is called the middle section of the book of Genesis, covering chapters 12 through 22. And here in this uh, section, you're going to see where Abraham is called. And you will notice that Abraham is uh, a migrant. He's always moving from one place to another. And really, the Bible calls him a stranger. And one of the things that we see as we look in the lesson is that God calls out to Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, this is the message the Lord said to him. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Amen. What a message of hope. What a message to encourage Abraham as he was called by God. And, you know, Abraham is considered and recognized as the father of the faithful. Yes. And uh, even today, the Jews have high regard for Abraham. And you can see in the New Testament when the Jews were talking to Jesus, they would say, we are Abraham's children. And so a lot, a lot of pride because Abraham is really the beginning of the, let's call it the Jewish nation. And wonderful promises were made by God to Abraham. And we're going to look at that now as we move into Sunday's portion of the lesson. The lesson is entitled for Sunday, Abraham's Departure. Abraham's Departure. We're covering Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Let's go to verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now notice here uh, that Abram is, is his name at this time. Later his name is changed, and we're, that will be covered later on. Uh, when you see here this particular uh, verse, you see that Abraham... Abraham is, is receiving a covenant promise by God himself. And so the message to Abraham was, get out of your country. And uh, it starts with that. He says, uh, when you say get out of your country, he says, don't move to the next city. Don't move to another portion of the city. Get out of your country. And God is familiar with Abraham and he is clear about it. You know, uh, the way it is expressed from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. In other words, he was going to go to a place where no one knew him. Mm -hmm. He could not rely on anybody, brothers or sisters or uncles, whoever was left, 
to ask for advice, to ask for comfort. Abraham was chosen to leave because even in his family, already they were beginning to mingle the worship of the true God with worshiping idols. Mm. And the Lord called Abraham to separate him from this situation that was beginning to take place. Now, uh, notice that he is told that I will show you. Abraham left not knowing where he was going, but we can understand that Abraham knew the voice of God. Amen. Remember that Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow. So when God calls to Abraham, uh, Abraham is familiar with God's voice. He knew it was a message from God and he moved, uh, went immediately to action. Now we understand as we go on to verse two, that he did not leave alone. Verse two and onward. But notice the promises that God makes to Abraham. I will make you a great nation. Question, can God do that? <laughs> yes, he can. And I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Not only this, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Mm. What an amazing future God lays out before Abraham. And notice the different aspects of the blessings that God was presenting to him. Uh, you're gonna be a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great. And not only that, you shall be a blessing. And Notice that he says, I will bless those who bless you. And I believe that this is something that God does for all of his children. Amen. He will bless those right. who bless you. He will curse those who curse you. Mm -hmm. You know, God uh, <coughs> like, d does a hedge of protection about his children. Mm -hmm. He protects them. And you can see that in Job chapter 1, when Satan uh, is uh, told by God, uh, have you considered my servant Job, mm -hmm. that there's none like him? <laughs> and, and, and Satan seems to respond, well, you have set a hedge of protection. It's apparently he tried to get to him, but the Lord was protecting Amen. Job just as he protects us. Now let's consider, uh, notice in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, a, something that will help us understand why God chose Abram. Why? Because Abram was faithful. Abram obeyed God. Abram was worshiping the true God according to the way he knew that God wanted him to serve him. And you will notice that wherever Abram went, what did he do? He set up an altar to worship the true God. Mm -hmm. And where Abraham went, people knew that he worshiped the true God. He was a witness. Now, one of the things that I want to bring out is that there are principles laid out in the scriptures and Abraham followed these principles. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13, 14, and 15, God speaking, or Moses uh, speaking, a message from the Lord to the people of Israel. It says, and it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full. And that is what Abraham, Abraham uh, followed. He followed the Lord. He was diligent to keep God's commandments. And I'm going to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that there was such an heart in them, that they should fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children. Abraham's faithfulness was a blessing to his family and eventually to his children. And in the same way, God has this message for us. If we are faithful, the Lord will bless us as well. This is a promise he made to the people of Israel. This is a promise such as he would make to his children today. 
If you diligently obey my commandments, I will bless the work of your hands. I will bless you so that you do not lack any good thing. So we can praise the Lord that his promises apply unto us as well. Now let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, I want to bring out this principle, and I'm going to share another one in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, and I'm going to ask one of the kind, wonderful people on the panel to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Notice, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. In other words, the blessings that God gives to an individual is not just for the individual. The individual is blessed, but it's for others to be blessed as well. Okay. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, Sister Shelley Quinn, please. Yes, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for this purpose, <laughs> for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen. So you see, the blessings that Abraham would receive, receive would be for the uh, edifying of the body of Christ. And this is why when you look at the promises that God made to Abraham, at the end, notice that it says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. If Abraham was faithful, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Now, why would that be? It is because through Abraham would come the Messiah. Yes, the Bible lays out a very, uh, very uh, strict to the, uh, and so and so begets so and so, and so and so begets so and so, to show us the lineage that will lead to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And through Jesus, all the families of the earth have been blessed Amen. and can be blessed if we allow Jesus to enter into our lives. So through Abraham obeying God, the whole world would be blessed. And now this is very, very interesting because sadly enough, it seems to me like the Jews did not fully understand that their father that they called Abraham, through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Not just the people of Israel, but all the families of the earth are to be blessed. And this is why you hear Jesus, when he's speaking, he says such things, and this gospel of the kingdom shall we preach in all the world, all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. This is a message of the Lord for each and every one of us. Now, let's move quickly. Uh, you know when this happened, when God called Abraham? This is a message for us that are getting gray hair, by the way. It says, so Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Aram. He was not a young man, but he obeyed the voice of the Lord. You too may be called of the Lord to do something. Obey and be blessed. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. I, my name is James Rafferty, and I have uh, Monday's lesson, which is entitled The Temptation of Egypt. And it's quite a turnaround from what we've just looked at, John, in the first part of Genesis chapter 12. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. And there was a famine in the land where Abraham was dwelling as God had called him out. And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there and for the famine was great or grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter th into Egypt, verse 11, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, verse 13, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for, for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass, verse 14, that when Abraham was come into Egypt, the Egyptian beheld a woman that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her, uh, commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entered and he ent entreated Abraham well, verse 16, for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called upon Abraham and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? 
Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me, to my wife. Now therefore behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they went, sent him away, his wife, and all that he had. So this is quite a contrast. You know, the first part of the chapter talks about how Abraham heard the voice of God. And God told him to depart. And he departed. The second part of the chapter says that there was a famine in the land. You know, the quarterly asked the question, why did Abraham leave the promised land to go to Egypt? And how did Pharaoh behave in comparison to Abraham? Well, Abraham left the promised land to go to Egypt because there was a famine in the land, a great famine in the land. Abraham didn't leave the promised land to go to Egypt because God told him to leave the promised land to go to Egypt. Abraham wasn't listening to the voice of God. He wasn't obeying the voice of God and going to Egypt. And then the second thing we find is Abraham goes to Egypt with a lie. He doesn't go to Egypt to be a witness. He goes to Egypt with a lie. And he tells his wife, don't tell Pharaoh you're my wife. Hmm. Tell him you're my sister, which is a half lie. You know, I love this story because it reminds us of how important it is for us to be honest and true. In the book of Revelation, we're told that liars are going to be outside the city. And we're also told of a people in the context of the mark of the beast, a people who have no guile in their mouths, Revelation 14, 5. Guile is something that is, I think, many times unnoticeable to us. You know, I don't know that Abraham's lie was, was noticeable to him because it was a half truth. Sarah was kind of related to him. In a sense, he wasn't lying and he was protecting himself. But here we go again, right, John? Self-preservation, trying to save ourselves by our works, by what we can do rather than trusting fully in God, listening to the voice of God and letting God lead us. Now, the reason why I think this story is so significant for us is because Abraham, Abram is us. We are Abram. We are the ones depicted in this story. We tell our half truths. We call them half truths, not half lies, right? To protect ourselves. We're worried about our future. We're worried about what's going on. We listen to the voice of God guiding us to one place, but we're not so willing to listen to him guiding us to another place or telling us to stay where the trouble seems to be. This was Abraham's situation, and this is our situation. It speaks to us today. Now, what's really interesting is, okay, so Abraham goes through all of this gymnastics to try to protect himself, preserve himself from the danger of the famine and from the potential danger of Pharaoh with Sarai. And then we have Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh is a heathen. Pharaoh isn't a follower of God. Pharaoh hasn't been, you know, listening to the voice of God, worshiping God. God hasn't promised to bless him. But Pharaoh hears God's voice, and immediately what does he do? He obeys him. He obeys God. And he goes right to Abraham. He says, wait a minute, Abraham. God just told me that Sarah is your wife. Why did you tell me she was your sister? Right? Now, Abraham, you need to go and I'm just going to let you go. I'm going to, in a sense, through, you know, the, the grace of God, you're going to be blessed. God is going to bless you through me. Here is God using a heathen leader to bless the one that he's called to be his light because his light Abram isn't shining as he's supposed to shine. And I can't think of how many times perhaps God has done that in my life and perhaps in your life, in all of our lives, where we can see that God has blessed others when he should have been using uh, to bless us, when used others to bless us when he should have been using us to bless others, especially people who are not familiar with God. The thing is, is that we recognize in Abraham's actions here our own failures, or we should recognize our own failures. And this doesn't happen once. This happens the second time with Abimelech, the Philistine leader. He does it again. Later in chapter 20, he, does, he goes through the whole process again. But what I love about this is God steps in. You know, God steps in to override, to overrule our failures. God steps in to overrule the decisions we make that are not necessarily in harmony with his call for us. God steps in and sometimes uses heathen people, people who don't know him, people who don't worship him, people who don't uh, attribute their lives to him, uses them to speak to us and to get us back on the right track. Mm -hmm. The quarterly talks about this in the context of Abraham's experience. It says the temptation of Egypt was often 
a problem for ancient Israelites. Egypt thus became a symbol of humans trusting in humans rather than in God. Again, the same situation with the Tower of Babel. We're going to Egypt because we want to protect ourselves. We want to, we want to uh, trust in what we can do and how, God can, how we can preserve ourselves rather than trusting in God. In Egypt, where water could be seen on a daily basis, faith was not necessary, for the promise of the land was immediately visible. Compared to the land of famine, Egypt sounded like a good place to be, despite what God had said to him, that is Abraham. The quarterly goes on. The Abraham who now leaves Canaan contrasts with the Abram who left Ur. Before Abram was portrayed as a man of faith who left Ur in response to God's call, now Abraham leaves the promised land by himself of his own volition. Before Abraham relied on God and he behaves like a, and now he behaves like a manipulative, unethical politician who counts only on himself. Mm. Did you catch the words that the quarterly shared here? A manipulative, unethical politician. Mm. And you know, as Christians, a lot of times we kind of poke fun at our political leaders at times. You know, the Bible tells us we should be praying for our political leaders in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and for all men in positions of responsibility. But we ourselves, those leaders are simply the outworking of us left to ourselves. When we don't listen to the voice of God, when we don't hear the, heed the voice of God, we will be just like Abraham was. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 130 says, During his stay in Egypt, Abraham gave evidence that he was not free from human weakness and imperfection. In concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, he betrayed a distrust of the divine care, a lack of lofty faith and courage so often nobly exemplified in his life. Now, again, I want to emphasize what brings me hope in this story is not so much that Abraham failed God, but that Abraham failed God in the sense that he still remained faithful to God. God still brought him through all of this, all of the failures, all of the imperfections, not just here, but later on, just a few chapters later, eight chapters later, he does it again. God brings him through that and God can bring us through that also. Amen. We need to have that hope. We need to have that belief. Amen. If the Bible were full of perfect people, we'd be in trouble. Yes. So we don't want to overemphasize the failures of Abraham. So what should this story teach us about how easy it is even for faithful Christians to stray from the correct path? The quarterly asks, why is disobedience never a good choice? And going even further, for further discussions, what was wrong in Abraham's half-truth regarding his sister's wife? Was it worse lying or saying some truth while still at the same time technically lying. What is, excuse me, what is worth lying or saying some truth while still at the same time technically lying? Now, I love this question. I really believe it's an important question for us because we are coming down to the time in history when God is calling us to stand without God. We looked at that verse or mentioned that verse in Revelation 14. What is worth, worse, lying or telling the truth when we're technically lying? Because a lot of times I find myself in situations where I have to make a choice about whether I'm just going to be truthful or whether my truthfulness is actually going to be a lie in disguise. Mm -hmm. And God is calling us higher than that, higher than the call that Abraham had as he wandered into Egypt on this half lie. He's calling us to follow the Lamb wherever he goes and to stand without guile before his presence. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor James. Well, this lesson is a blessing already, and we hope that you will stay tuned. We'll be right back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back. The blessings continue now. We move to Pastor Terry Shelton. Well, thank you, John. Um, I was really excited whenever I saw that uh, I had this lesson, uh, Tuesday's lesson, Abram and Lot. Now, the story of Abraham and Lot takes us through the entire chapter of uh, Genesis chapter 13. And we're not going to read that, uh, but we're going to pick out the highlights. Uh, I want to thank uh, Pastor James for that good exposition about the story into Egypt that leads us into this next part. You know, 
uh, chapter 12, we have this unfortunate incident of Abraham taking his, his tribe down into Egypt. And it was not God's will for him to do so. And it seems that while he started up in Canaan, and after this, uh, his lack of faith in going down into Egypt, then he winds back up in Canaan again. If you read the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, it tells us that this famine was a test that God allowed to come upon Abram and his tribe to see if he really trusted God and see if he was really going to, I mean, even when it seems there's no, no food, no water, whatever, is he going to trust God and stay where God had led him? But unfortunately, he went down into, um, down into Egypt. So he winds up back near Bethel once again. And, you know, I believe that I believe that Abram repented, repented mm. of that. And so, you know, he must have said, Lord, I, I'm sorry, I didn't trust you. That didn't go the way I planned. You know, please help me get back on tra track. And I, I have no doubt that God uh, forgave him of that. But if, in, as we open chapter um, thir uh, 13, we find that uh, Lot and Abram's men there's some contention going on. Mm. There's not enough natural resources in, mm. in the land. And, and, and we could see, we can almost picture it how, let's say the, the, the herdsmen of, of Lot would come to a nice fertile pasture and then the herdsmen of, of Abram would come and there's, hey, we were here first. No, we, you know, we, we have authority and blah, blah, blah. And who's, who's to choose? So Abram recognized that. And um, I love how the fact that Abram steps forward to be a peacemaker. Mm. It says, um, it says that, that he basically gave Lot the choice. If whatever we, you choose where you want to go and I will take the other one. He steps forward to be this, uh, this peacemaker. It made me think of Matthew chapter five and verse nine, which says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Mm -hmm. I think Abram was trying to, to, to squelch the, the division and the strife going on there. He said, no, we shouldn't be this way. Now, if you think of it, by all rights, Abram was the elder and he had every right mm -hmm. to, to choose which direction he was going to go. Right. But in effect, by letting, by letting uh, Lot choose, I, I, I believe that he was letting God choose mm. and he was letting God, allowing God to direct him in the way that he would go. Abraham or Abram showed humility in this, uh, yes. in this venture. It made me think of first Peter chapter five and verse six, mm. therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. What we're speaking about here is character. What was the character of Abram? He, he, he didn't want this strife. He doesn't want this. And I think maybe he was even exercising some faith and letting God direct the situation. And of course, God did direct him to the, the, right, uh, the right area. Someone once said that character is not developed during times of crisis. Character is revealed during times of crisis. And it is during this time that Abraham, even though his, his relationship with God was a little rocky and he'd just come through this major test that he, that he failed, he still had a connection with God and his connection with God showed forth in his life in trying to be a peacemaker here. Um, however, Lot, Lot showed a, a very selfish uh, uh, nature when he, it, because in verse 11, it says, Lot chose for himself, mm. you know, he, what can I get out of this? Mm. What, without any regard to the people that live there or what he might encounter in this land, he just saw those fertile lands and he said, I want that. That's, I'll take that. And Abraham just graciously, okay, fine. If you want to go that way, you know, okay, then I'm going to go this way. At letting, letting God actually, um, uh, direct in this situation. And then I like it. It says, and, and to demonstrate his faith, God asks Abraham to arise and walk in the land, just like he owns it, you know, mm. walk there. And, and even though you don't have full possession of the land yet, walk there because I'm going to give you this land. I'm giving you this land. Mm. Um, in fact, in, in, um, uh, I forget which verse it is. I didn't, I didn't annotate it in my notes here, but there's one passage that says, I give it to you. Mm. Um, the new King James version says, I give the King James version says, I will give, mm. but 
Sometimes God says, I will do something. And then sometimes God says, I do something. Mm. I am doing mm. something. You see, friends, one of the things I love about God is that he exists in the past and the present and the future and even outside of the past, present mm -hmm. and future. Amen. He is eternal. That's he right. never changes. He is always the same. It makes me think of this passage and Pastor John, I know that you love this passage, Isaiah 43 verse one. Mm -hmm. but, now, but now says, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Amen. That's today, that's now, that's right. you are mine. And I love that passage. God speaks, when God speaks something, it is so, and it will be so, and it is so, and it has been so, all of the above. Mm -hmm. And then it says in Genesis 13 and verse eight, it says that Abraham moved his tent and he went and dwelt by the terebinth tree of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and he built an altar there mm. to the Lord. What have we learned about the altar in the, in the past? The altar is about worship. It's about thanksgiving. It's about sacrifice. Did Abraham have complete control of the land yet? No, but he thanked God in advance. And by faith, he took hold of that promise that God had made to him. Years ago, I remember reading a book entitled The ABCs of Bible Prayer. And it talks about ask and believe and claim. And when I think of that, that mode of thinking, it reminds me of Mark 11 and verse 24. Jesus says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. I love that promise. Mm -hmm. so, so what do we learn from the story of Abram and Lot? Um, we learn that we can choose whether we're going to be kind and generous to others, even if there's contention, if there's strife. Sometimes, you know, they, they talk about taking the high road. Sometimes we have to do that, especially if we are walking with Christ on a daily basis. Maybe those that we have problems with. It is our responsibility and really our privilege to to take the high road and do like Abraham, like Abram did and, and, and try to keep the peace. I don't know, some families and some families, there's always a peacemaker, right? There's somebody who just doesn't like strife. And they're always trying to bring sides together. I kind of feel like in this situation, the Abram was a little like that. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of these uh, passage from uh, Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22, where the wise man says, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Mm. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. That's right. I think that's beautiful. It's beautiful. Now we're not saying that Abraham and Lot were necessarily enemies in this case, but in this situation, there was strife, there was conflict. And Abram, he decided to let God drive on this one. He decided to let God direct and let's face it, it came out better. As we know, the story goes on. It came out better for Abram in the end. So I, I, I love this story because it shows Abram's humility mm -hmm. and, 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 and willing to let God lead in this situation. Even though that we know that we've read all the stories and we know that there's some failures still yet to come. But in this time, God, Abram let, decided to let God lead and guide in this situation. And it ended up being good for him. That's right. Amen. Thank you for that lesson. When God leads, it's always good. Amen. And the outcome is always going to glorify God. Amen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 14. We're going to talk about the Babel coalition. Now, sometimes the size of the enemy or the size of those who are standing against us tend to affect our way that we think about God. Mm. Sometimes we say, Lord, this is not a situation that's going to turn out well for me. And this is one of the reasons I believe the story was put here. Now, there's some words in here that will choke the average human. <laughs> but I'm going to try to be a little more than average and ask the Lord to give me the, the ability to enunciate these words. Genesis 14, verses 1 to 17. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariah, king of Elisar, and Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, the title king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admar, and Shemer, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Belar, that is Zoar. 
All these joined together in the Valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedol Leomar, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedol Leomar and the kings that were with him came and attacked Rephaim and Ashtaroth, Carnium and Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shiva, Kirathiam, and the Horites in the mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked the country of the Malachites, and also the Amorites, who dwelt in Hezazon, Hazizon, Tamar, and the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Admar, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Belar, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in the battle in the valley of Siddim against Chedoliomar, king of Elam, title king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Look at the size of the battle. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth tree in Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Anar, and they were aliens with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheveh, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Shedele Omar and the kings who were with him. What a tongue twister. Oh, I tell you. I'm glad you got that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, Good job. It's, uh, it's amazing how we look at these Bible characters. Now, I believe the reason why the Lord wanted this story included is he could have easily said, Abram had to face a large army. Mm. But if you take each one of the components mentioned here, you find this is the first war narrated in scripture mm. where all the adversaries were named. You had the coalition of four armies of the Mesopotamians and Mesopotamia and Persia against the other coalition of five Canaanite armies, including the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this was a large contingency. This is a huge battle, but sometimes you could get lost in the size of the opposition and forget the size of God. Mm. And Abram didn't do that. Abram decided that I don't need to fight against all of the coalition that is uh, armed against me. My focal point simply needs to be, I need to rescue my nephew and his household. Mm. And when you look at the battle, the timing of this entire thing suggests that this was a global skirmish for the size of the world at that time. And it focused on interrupting the plans that God had for Abram and his nephew, Lot. So what did Abram do? You notice Abram gathered his army together, but when he went, he didn't go to defeat all the, he didn't go to defeat all the battles. He went by twilight. He didn't go in a time that they could see him. He went during the night and he focused on just capturing his nephew. Let's look at verse 12 and 13 of, of Genesis chapter 14. Once again, notice what he did. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So that was the focal point of Abram's um, rescue. He was not focusing on defeating the enemy. He was focusing simply on rescuing a family member that had been taken captive and all of his household. And Ellen White says in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, she says, Abram 
dwelling in peace in the Oaks of Mamre learned from one of the fugitives the story of the battle and the calamity that had befallen his nephew. He had cherished no unkind memories of Lot's ingratitude. Even though Lot was not gracious to him, he still sought to rescue him. Yes. After his affection for him, all his affection for him was awakened when he heard about Lot's dilemma. And he determined that he should be rescued. Seeking, first of all, divine counsel, Abraham prepared for battle. Mm. Now, this story is significant because it brought out some components, and I like what James brought out. Sometimes uh, we tend to deal uh, half-heartedly either in the things we say mm. or the way that people are represented. In this situation, Abraham put aside his feelings about Lot and thought about the outcome, how this could impact his family at large. So he decided, let me go ahead and rescue my nephew. And we could work out the family squabbles later on. And I think uh, John Dinsey pointed out how he gave uh, Lot the choice. You go one way, I go the other. And uh, that, was, that was what Terry said. You, get, you go one way, I go the other. And the way that Lot chose didn't really turn out that well for him. But the way that Abram chose turned out that much better for him because he chose God's counsel. Well, there are stories in the Bible that have similar scenarios. And the lessons that we could learn from this, as in the example of Elisha, when the Syrians came and surrounded his army, surrounded his home, and his servant thought that his end had come. He said, Alas, Master, what shall we do? And Elisha prayed for the Lord to open the eyes of his servants. And then we know the story. He saw chariots of fire. Mm -hmm. And instead of destroying the Syrian army, as Terry pointed out, mm -hmm. and um, they fed them instead, mm -hmm. and they were so kind to their enemy that the enemy decided we're not messing with them any longer. Mm -hmm. But as time came, Ben-Hadad forgot the lessons of the past. We also find the example of Peter being thrown in prison by Herod. Once again, a large Roman contingency against one man, mm -hmm. but God was with him. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the lessons we could learn from Lot and Abram, from Elisha and his servant, from Peter and his, uh, and his incarceration for doing God's will? Here are the lessons we can learn. Psalm 34, verse 19, I brought out two major lessons. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yep. So once again, I'm going to say what I did in the very beginning. Sometimes we could focus on the size of our adversary and forget the size of our God. Mm. There are afflictions that many of us will experience in our walk as Christians. Also remember, these afflictions are not as great as they could have been because the Lord is on your side. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Mm. While we do not look at the things which are seen, a huge army, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here's my point as I transition and give it to Shelley. When you face skirmishes in life, when you are surrounded by enemies that seem too numerous to count or too numerous to defeat. Remember, if God before you, no one can be against you. Don't focus on the size of the adversary. Keep your focus on the size of your God. Thank you, John. I'm sure glad I didn't have to read those, all those names. Um, I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday and it is the tithe of Melchizedek. Let's be, look at Genesis chapter 14 and we'll Start with verse 17. The king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shabbat. He's going out to meet Abram. That is the king's valley after his, after Abram's return from the defeat of Shadow Leomar and the kings who were with him. And Melchizedek is the king of Salem. He brings bread and wine and he's, it says he was the priest of the Most High God. We're going to look into this mysterious Melchizedek, but here's the point of our lesson. Melchizedek, this king of Salem, this king of righteousness, he blesses Abraham and he says in verse 18, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. 
that's God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your servant, your enemies, into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him a tenth, which is a tithe, of all is what the verse 20, that's how it ends. Mm. So this is the most mysterious person in the Bible, but he's not that mysterious. Mm. Melchizedek, and in, in, he's introduced here in Genesis 14. He's only mentioned one other time in the Old Testament, that's Psalm 110. And then we don't find him again till Hebrews in 5, 6, and 7, those chapters start talking about him. But who is this Melchizedek? He's both king of Salem. That's another name for Jerusalem. He's the priest of the Most High God. He is the only human being other than the person of Jesus Christ who was ever a king and a priest holding both offices. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting. His name is translated King of Righteousness, King of Peace. So Jerusalem is peace. But in Hebrews 7, 3, this is what everybody gets mixed up with Melchizedek. It says, he being without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God. In other words, Melchizedek is going to resemble Jesus in some way, remains the priest continually. Now, here's the point. When the Bible says that he was without genealogy, if we look at the ancient Syriac Peshetta, there's a much better translation. And here's what it says. When, it, when it, he says it's without genealogy, having neither uh, father or mother, what this accurate translation says is whose father and mother are not written in the genealogies. Mm -hmm. His ancestry didn't matter mm -hmm. because he was of the order of priesthood. It wasn't like the Levitical priesthood. He was a priest forever. So his ancestry was irrelevant to his priesthood and it was not recorded. So I just want to make a couple of points before we get to the tithing part. I've got to hurry. In Hebrews 7.15, well, first, Hebrews 5, 6 says that Jesus' priesthood was in the order of Melchizedek as opposed to being in the order of Aaron, the Levitical order. Christ's priesthood was superior to the Levitical. And verse chapter 7 and verse 15 of Hebrews explains that Jesus was a priest in that same order, the likeness of Melchizedek. Melchizedek resembled Jesus, but that means he was different than Jesus. He was not a heavenly being as so many people try to make him out because if he was without parentage, if he didn't have a mother or father or beginning or the end, he'd be God himself and there would have been no reason for God to have to come down and become the person of Jesus Christ to be our new high priest. There would have been no reason for another priesthood. So Jesus was not a successor to Melchizedek, just the priesthoods were similar. So let's talk about the practice of biblical tithing. This story shows that Abraham recognizes Melchizedek is a priest of the Most High God, and he gives him a tenth of all of his war booty in response to God, who is possessor of heaven and earth, who has given everything to Abraham, delivered his enemies into his hand. Mm. Then Abraham is going to return a tithe a tenth of everything that God has just given him. Now, this is interesting. We see Abraham practicing the tithe. Then we get to Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. And as he's, he's in exile, he's a fugitive, and he pledges to God 
to return a tenth or a tithe of all of his possessions upon his safe return. That's Genesis 28, 22. Mm -hmm. he, Jacob says, of all that you give me, he's speaking to God, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, when Israel was established as a nation after their exodus from Egypt, God reaffirmed tithing as a divine institution. It's clearly laid out in Genesis, but God tells them their prosperity depends upon it. Let me give you a few scriptures if you're taking notes. Leviticus 27, 30 through 32, Numbers 18, 24, 26, 28, Deuteronomy 12, 6, 11, and 17. So returning tithe has always been an important part of worship. It is something in Second Chronicles, what we see is during the reign of King Hezekiah, he brings about this great reformation. And in Second Chronicles 31, 5 and 6, one of the first things they do in this religious reformation is the people eagerly bring their tithes. So the New Testament assumes the validity of tithing by setting forth Abraham as our example. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus even said to the, the Pharisees, in, uh, he, he shows he approved mm -hmm. of tithing. Matthew 23, 23, he says, what are you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which are justice, mercy, and mm. faith. These you ought to have done, talking about his tithe, their tithing, without leaving the others undone. So here these scribes meticulously tithe everything but they didn't have the spirit of God's love in them. And Jesus says, hey, yeah, you should be tithing, but don't leave out justice, mercy, and compassion and faith. Mm -hmm. Romans 4, 16. I want to read that to you. Romans 4, 16 mm -hmm. tells us the patri patriarch Abraham is the father of us all. Mm -hmm. And listen to what it says. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, because now we are the seed too, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So as the father of all believers, Abraham is set forth in the New Testament as our model for Christians to return the tithe. Just as he tithed till Melchizedek, acknowledging his priesthood, we're supposed to be returning what God gives to us to acknowledge the priesthood of Jesus. And here's something that is amazing to me. When you get to Hebrews chapter 7, and it's repeating this story of Melchizedek. It is such a casual reference to mm. tithing that you realize it indicates that tithing was already an established principle, a custom in the Christian church, mm. even at that early date. That's right. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Well, this has been an interesting lesson and time has seemed to fly. Uh, we'd like to give each one of you, probably have about a minute each almost, to give a summary or a final thought. Well, when you look at the story of Abraham and you realize that in the first part of chapter 12, he does great following God's voice and coming out of her. And then the second part of chapter 12, he falls on his face. You, you recognize that this is a continuum with Abraham. In other words, he does really well in relation to Lot. He does really well in relation to rescuing his cousin and, and uh, giving ties to Melchizedek, etc. But there are times like with Abimelech when he again tells a falsehood. There are times when he distrusts God and gets together with Hagar and hoping to fulfill the promise. It's not the occasional deeds or misdeeds, but it's the general tendency of the life. Amen. Abraham keeps his focus on Jesus and he lets Jesus lift him up from all of his failures and we can do the same thing. Amen. 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 You know, I was thinking that um, 
in the failure of Abraham going into Egypt right after that, um, I, I, the repentance I'm sure that came from, came from him and letting God direct and in, in the story with himself and, and Lot. And I, I go back to that, that passage that I read before, 1 Peter 5, 6, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when God exalts his people and he uh, it seemingly parades them in front of the universe and says, these are the ones who humbled themselves and, and e e even, you know, crucified themselves th th every day, died daily. And uh, I want to lift them up and I hope and pray that uh, each one of you will be among that number. Amen. That's right. And the story of Abram and Lot was amazing when it came to the coalition of Babylon. We're going to be facing a coalition of symbolic Babylon in the near, not too distant future. And as Abram did, we must also do focus on delivering our relatives, those who may have been bound by the captivity that Babylon represents. Mm. And so I would encourage you not to be focusing on the size of the coalition because all the nations that stand against the principles of God will unite themselves with Babylon. And remember this text, the Lord is on your side, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We will win because we're on the right side. Amen and amen. You know, I just want to say one thing. I, I love now that we are getting into the patriarchal history of Genesis. Remember this. Genesis covers 2,300 years of history, 2,000 in the first 11, and in the last 39, we're looking at several hundred more years. Sometimes people will say, oh, Genesis doesn't lay out God's commandments. That didn't come along till Exodus. That's not true. You find all of these biblical principles all throughout the history of Abraham's life. He obeyed God, but Abraham also knew that a principle of worship was to return a tithe and we are encouraged mm -hmm. to do the same. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor James Rafferty, Pastor Terry Shelton, Pastor John Lomacang, and Sister Shelley Quinn. And we want to thank you for joining us. Remember that 3ABN Cyber School panel will be back next week with lesson number seven. Lesson number seven, the title is The Covenant with Abraham. And if you missed any of the lessons, you can go to the 3ABN YouTube channel 3ABN Plus also on your phones. Uh, you can also uh, watch them there. Thank you for joining us. We hope the next time you will be with us and join us on 3ABN Sabbath School panel to continue studying God's Word together. We'll see you next time.